Federalist 25, Part 2. I'll start with Paragraph 5. The framers of the existing Confederation, fully aware, fully aware of the dangers to the Union from the separate possession of military forces by the states, having expressed terms prohibited them from having either ships or troops unless with the consent of Congress. So he says, even right now, under the Confederacy, different states cannot have their own navies. They can't have their own armies. They can have their militias, but they can't have an army. So he says, even right now, with our bad constitution, this is the system we live under. The truth is that the existence of a federal government and military establishments under state authority are not less at variance with each other than a due supply of the federal treasury and the system of quotas and requisitions. And remember, any time there was a national emergency, the Congress had to ask, make requisitions. And they'd have to talk about quotas, how many troops which every state would send. This was always a chaos, chaotic. There are other lights besides those already presented in which the impropriety of restraints on the discretion of the national legislature will be equally manifest. The design of the objection which has been mentioned is to preclude standing armies in times of peace, in time of peace. Though we've never been informed how far it is desired the prohibition should extend, whether to raising armies as well as to keeping them up in a season of tranquility or not. If it be confined to the latter, it will have no precise signification and it will be ineffectual for the purpose intended. When armies are once raised, what shall be denominated keeping them up, contrary to the sense of the Constitution? What time shall be requisite to ascertain the violation? Shall it be a week, a month, or a year? Or shall we say they may be continued as long as the danger which occasion their being raised, continues, this would be to admit that they might be kept up in time of peace against threatening or impending danger, which would be at once to deviate from the literal meaning of the prohibition and to, and to introduce an extensive latitude of construction. Who shall judge of the continuance of the danger. This must undoubtedly be submitted to the national government and the matter would then be brought to this issue that the national government to provide against apprehended danger might in the first instance raise troops and might afterwards keep them on foot as long as they supposed the peace or safety of the community was in any degree of jeopardy. It is easy to perceive that the discretion so latitudinary as this would afford ample room for eluding the force of the provision. So pretty much, he says, if, if we don't get our act together, if we don't have a small professional army, we'll be dealing with a lot of chaos. Let's say you, our critics, are saying we can't have a standing army and it's, we can only do, raise an army when we are under attack or we are about to be attacked. It says, okay, when you raise an army, you need to keep it on foot. How long are you going to keep it on foot? A week? A month? Who is going to decide? Who is going to pay for it? 
which state is going to send how many troops. He says you're asking for trouble when you're establishing a system like the Articles of Confederation has, a chaotic system. We have to have a small professional army not to have to deal with this thing. The next paragraph, the supposed utility of a provision of this kind must be founded upon a supposed probability or at least possibility of a combination between the executive and legislative in some scheme of usurpation. Should this at any time happen, how easy would it be to fa fabricate pretenses of approaching danger? Indian hostilities instigated by Spain or Britain would always be at hand. Provocations to produce the desired appearances might, be, might even be given to some foreign power and appeased again by timely concessions. If we can reasonably presume such a combination to have been formed and that the enterprise is warranted by sufficient prospect of success, the army, when once raised from whatever cause or on whatever pretext, may be applied to the execution of the project. Another thing that he's warning people about, he says sometimes in some of these states, your governor or your legislature might want to have a good relationship, favor, favorable relationship, let's say with British or with Spanish, and they might look for an excuse to raise an army and then before you know it start a, an authoritarian regime, a tyrannical regime and the way they'll do it is they'll scare you, they'll say oh let's say the Native Americans are gonna attack us and with that excuse they'll keep you scared and the army they raise then they could use it to tyrannize you, your home. So that's another reason that we have to be careful not to have 13 different armies, 13 different navies, because the British, the Spanish will always want to divide us and they'll do any scheme, they'll do anything, they'll produce any scheme to make that happen. Then he goes in the next paragraph, if to obviate this consequence, it should be resolved to extend the prohibition to the raising of armies in time of peace. The United States would then exhibit the most extraordinary spectacle which the world has yet seen, that of a nation incapacitated by its constitution to prepare for defense before it was actually invaded, as the ceremony of a formal denunciation of war has of late fallen into disuse. The denunciation of war means the declaration of war. Even back then, they were not using denunciation anymore. Um, <clears throat> fallen into disuse, the presence of an enemy within our territory must be weighted for as the legal warrant to the government to begin its levies of men for the protection of the state. We must receive the blow before we could even prepare to return it. All that kind of policy by which nations anticipate distant danger and meet the gathering storm must be abstained from as contrary to the genuine maxims of a free government. We must expose our property and liberty to the mercy of foreign invaders and inv invite them by our own weakness to seize the naked and defenseless prey because we are afraid that rulers 
created by our choice, dependent on our will, might endanger that liberty by an abuse of the means necessary to its preservation. So he says, we are going to be the joke in the history of the world. If we don't have a national army, we'll be like the people who were made fun of because they waited till an invading army, actually, till an army invaded their lands and then they started talking about putting their army together, raising an army, training them. He says that is foolish. And he says, especially with the experience that we had when the British came and invaded. See, this, since especially the Federalist Papers are written first to the people of New York, when you follow the American Revolution, at first, one of the places they invaded after Boston was Manhattan, and the island of New York. And then, <clears throat> so New Yorkers, especially people around New York City, had a good first-hand experience of what an invading army, military can do. So he's saying, don't wait till that happens, especially when the British went into New York, Washington's army, the American army, kept on losing, losing battles, and they had to, they got lucky, they could actually draw back without being decimated, without being destroyed. So he says, don't be foolish, don't wait till a foreigners invade us before we start thinking about the army because then we will go down in history as a joke as a people who were not even sensible enough to put an army together a small enough army professional army so that at least they can repel stop the first attack stop the surprise attack so he says we don't want to be fools like that 